Hello, everybody, and welcome to Nutrition 101. Today, we're going to be discussing protein, which is the third macronutrient that provides calories, the first two being carbohydrates and lipids. The main difference between protein and the other macronutrients is that protein contains nitrogen as well as carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and the presence of this nitrogen allows protein to serve a very special function in biochemistry in which it acts as a information storage and transfer medium and gives instructions for your body to do various tasks or additionally helps other reactions happen more quickly in the form of enzymes or hormones. Proteins are found in many foods, the most concentrated source being animal meat, but also things like dairy and eggs, as well as nuts and grains, all contain significant amounts of protein. And when you eat protein, it gets digested into smaller components called amino acids before it gets absorbed. And then our body recombines them into things called peptides, which is a chain of amino acids, which eventually becomes either a enzyme or a protein or a hormone of some kind. And we remember from previous lectures that proteins contain four kilocalories per gram and that you should consume about 10% of your calories from protein every day. Now, the protein serves a number of functions in our body. It can function as a growth mechanism as well as tissue repair and maintenance of body systems. Uh, specifically, there are structural proteins such as collagen and keratin, which help form the building blocks of your body. Then there are contractile proteins that help your muscles function, such as actin and myosin. There are um, proteins that act as chemical catalysts, which help chemical reactions happen more quickly, such as digestion reactions. Um, we refer to these as enzymes. They can also be transport mechanisms for things like fat or minerals or vitamins. Uh, they can store um, various nutrients or energy. Um, they can make hormones and hormone receptors. They can act as protective agents in the form of antibodies and clotting factors. They can assist in pH balance and fluid balance, and sometimes they're involved in our sensory perception. For instance, opsin, which is a protein in your eyes which helps you see. Now, proteins are digested beginning in the stomach when the enzyme pepsinogen is activated by hydrochloric acid into pepsin, uh, and this is where pro large proteins start getting broken down into peptide chains. Now, once food passes into the small intestine, things called proteases break protein down into peptides, and something called peptidases break those peptides down into amino acids. Once this is finished, digestion is completed, and these amino acids can be absorbed into the small intestine. Now, this is a diagram of that process. We start in the mouth, and proteins are crushed by chewing and moistening by saliva. And then the food travels down the esophagus into the stomach, where gastrin stimulates the production of stomach acid and pepsin and the proteins are denatured by hydrochloric acid once the pepsin is activated it breaks proteins into single amino acids and smaller polypeptides via a process called hydrolysis and then in the small intestine proteases are secreted to digest the polypeptides into small units and peptidases are um, located in the cells in the wall of the small intestine to complete the breakdown of all polypeptides into single amino acids. So sometimes you can absorb small chains of amino acids into your intestinal lining and it gets further broken down in your intestinal lining into single amino acids. You don't absorb any protein 
as full molecules. All protein is broken down into amino acids before it enters your bloodstream. These amino acids, once they're in your bloodstream, travel to the liver via the portal vein. And in the liver, the amino acids are then converted into glucose or fat to make, or combined to make new proteins or used directly for energy or sometimes released into the bloodstream and sent to cells so that they can make proteins. Here's a slightly more detailed picture of the process um, showing starting in the mouth and showing sort of the process of breaking the protein down in the stomach. They start out as a sort of a large globule and it gets denatured and its shape changes in the acid and it turns into a long strand that is then broken into chunks and then in the small intestine those small chunks are broken down into even smaller chunks and as they pass into the enterocytes they finish being broken down and they end up in your bloodstream. Now we're going to talk about exactly what an amino acid is because it's uh, significantly different than the lipids and carbohydrates that we've encountered so far. The basic structure of an amino acid is there's carbon in the center, there's a nitrogen group called an amine group on one side, and an acid group on the other side, hence the name amino acid. Now, you don't have to really know the chemistry of this because chemistry isn't a prerequisite for this course. However, the key point to keep in mind here is that the amino acid part always stays the same but this side chain group shown here is different for each amino acid so something like glycine has a single hydrogen here but leucine has this more complicated carbon group and aspartic acid has another acid group and each different amino acid has a different side chain group that's slightly different and lends different chemistry which is what gives proteins their unique ability to encode information, which we'll get to as we talk about protein synthesis. But first, there are 20 amino acids. Nine of them are what we refer to as essential, meaning that our bodies can't make them, and so we must consume them in our diet. The other amino acids are used in protein synthesis by our body, but our body can make them in sufficient quantities as long as you get enough of all of the rest of these to make all the proteins that you need to survive. And this is a picture showing the relative amount of protein in various foods. So in one cup of milk, there's about 8 grams of protein, 3 grams of protein in one slice of whole wheat bread, 2 grams of protein in a half cup of vegetables, or 7 grams of protein in 1 ounce of meat, which is equivalent to 1 half a cup of legumes, which are beans and peas. So, when we're choosing protein foods, we, think, we want to think about the quality of the protein that we're getting from that food. Now, high quality proteins are generally foods that are highly digestible and animal sources of protein tend to be more digestible than plant sources of protein however plant sources of protein can be prepared in such a way that they are highly bioavailable especially for people who are vegetarians the other thing that determines protein quality is the am amino acid composition of that protein and specifically how much of what we call limiting amino acids are present in that protein food So, obviously, in order for your body to be able to make all the proteins that it needs, you have to have all of the essential amino acids in your diet. And a limiting amino acid is any amino acid that is missing or of low abundance in the foods that you're consuming. This slows down or sometimes even halts protein synthesis. And another thing that hinders protein synthesis is when you don't eat enough calories um, because if you don't eat enough calories then your body is forced to use protein for energy and therefore it can't use the protein to make 
other proteins because you have to break down the protein irreparably in order to use it for energy. This brings us to a metric of protein digestibility corrected amino acid score, which is a metric that lists uh, milk protein and egg whites as a having a reference value of one, meaning that eating them is a complete protein that you can survive on. And then things like soybean isolate are about 0.99. Beef is a 0.92. Interestingly enough, pea flour is a very highly um, bioavailable protein. And for this reason, recently a number of meatless uh, beef patties have come out using pea flour as their main protein source. Things like the Impossible Burger. Um, it's a good one. Also, other beans are fairly high in usable protein. Oats are quite high in protein. And things like lent lentils and peanuts and whole wheat are also very high in protein. An incomplete protein is a protein that doesn't have all of the essential amino acids that you need. And therefore, it does not support growth and health. In contrast, a complete protein or high-quality protein has sufficient amounts of all nine essential amino acids, and these tend to be derived from animal or soy protein. Now, proteins can be made complete by doing a, something called mutual supplementation, where you take two or more incomplete protein sources and combine them and eat them together to make a complete protein. Um, Complementary proteins are two foods that do such a thing where they, together, they provide all nine essential amino acids. And here are some examples. So, legumes tend to be limited in the amino acids methionine and cysteine. And so, when eating legumes, you can complement them with grains, nuts, and seeds, because those contain methionine and cysteine. Um, things like red beans and rice, minestrone soup, chickpeas and couscous, or hummus, which is garbanzo beans and sesame seeds, are all complete proteins. Grains are limited in lysine, so you eat legumes with them, and they, which contain lysine, and that makes them into a complete protein. So peanut butter and bread is actually a complete protein. Uh, you put some jam on there and you get a bunch of vitamins. You probably get some more carbs and you're ready for the day. Barley and lentil soup is packed with both high-quality protein and a fair amount of soluble fiber. Uh, corn tortillas and beans. Bean burrito. It's, um, it's life food, as we call it. Uh, and vegetables tend to be limited in lysine, methionine, and cysteine. So you supplement vegetables with legumes for the lysine and grains, nuts, and seeds for the methionine and the cysteine. Things like tofu and broccoli with almonds or spinach salad with pine nuts and kidney beans will give you a complete protein. And then nuts and seeds tend to be limited in lysine and isoleucine. And so you supplement them with legumes and you end up with things like lentil soup with slivered almonds or sesame seeds in the mixed bean salad. Uh, you sometimes have to get a little creative, but it's absolutely possible to get plenty of protein without eating animal sources. In general, your body needs approximately 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, so if you know what you weigh in pounds and you divide it by 2.2 that gives you your weight in kilograms and you multiply that by 0.8 to get the grams of protein that you need so for instance if you weigh 120 pounds then you uh if you divide 120 by 0.22 or by 2.2 you get uh 54.5 you multiply that by 0.8 and you're at 40, about 44 grams of protein for the day. That's 120 pounds is a very little person, so most people need to be consuming a fair amount of protein every day. This, there is no daily value listed on the food labels for um, nutrition facts because there is a 
there are a lot of factors that affect how much protein any individual person needs. And so it's hard to establish an exact daily value. However, if you take in more protein than you need, then it will be automatically converted into fat. If you take in too little protein, it can have serious consequences on your health over time. And we'll talk a little bit about both of those things. This is a more detailed indication of how much protein you need to eat. Uh, in general, most adults, this is a rep, somebody who has a low activity level. You know, you're probably sitting at a desk all day long. Or even if you're even moderately active, you probably aren't breaking down enough body protein to need more than 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. However, if you are doing endurance athletics and you are not a vegetarian, you probably will need... 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilogram, which is significantly more. If you are a vegetarian, you might need a little bit more protein just because you have to branch out to get more amino acids. And if you're trying to do very intense athletics, you might have to even bump it up a bit higher. But really, nobody needs to eat more than about 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight a day. Above that, you start to get into things like nitrogen toxicity, which we'll talk a little bit about. Now here is an interesting table. This is the self-reported protein intake of athletes. So this is people in doing these sports telling a nutritionist about their dietary choices and how much protein they're eating in a day. Uh, it makes a big difference which type of sport you're doing. Obviously a football player is taking in 1.5 grams per kilogram, which is ending up being a total of 15% of their total calories. Um, <laughs> soccer, everybody always talks about soccer being the most physically demanding sport. They take in 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day for a total of 14.4% of their total calories. That's the highest one on this list. Things like triathlon runners and marathon runners take in a lot because they do a lot of damage to their body and then they need to fix that damage daily. Uh, the other people that are high are bodybuilders who can consume upwards to three grams of protein of, per day. That's because they are literally breaking down their muscles and building them bigger regularly. And so they're constantly uh, in great need of protein supply. And they need more protein on... Uh, in a relative way than other people need. So they don't need as much, as many carbs, for instance, but they need a lot more protein to build muscle. And the other thing about protein is that you want to split up your um, protein consumption because you can't absorb that much at once. So if you need 60 grams a day, you should split that up into three or four sessions of protein consumption so that you get more than like 20 grams at a time. Here is a nice big old table showing the protein content of various foods. You can see beef is pretty high on the list here. 3.5 ounces has 24 grams of protein if it's lean. And something like top sirloin has 27 grams of protein, 0.3.5 ounce serving. And then you go down um, poultry like chicken and turkey are very high. Some seafoods like tuna are pretty high. And then you get down into dairy and it starts to, um, it's a liquid, so there's a lot of water in it. So there's not as much protein per unit weight. But when you get down into like the cheeses, like cottage cheese has 31 grams of protein per cup. That's something that you might consider if you're a vegetarian, eating a lot of cottage cheese or Sometimes yogurt, but yogurt isn't even as high. Um, and soy products like tofu and tempeh have a decent amount of protein. A lot of beans, they don't have as much as meat, but you tend to eat more of them. They also have a decent amount of complex carbohydrates and soluble fiber in them, so they kind of get double, double duty. And then nuts, in addition to being a good source of a wide variety of protein and amino acids, they can be a good source of 
polyunsaturated fats and essential fatty acids. So you sort of kill two birds, one stone there. And then if you're trying to pack in protein in every nook and cranny, eating things like barley, beef barley soup is a really nice way to get a lot of protein even when you're eating carbs. Same with oatmeal. So, yeah. And then all the rest of these, you know, you can sort of... Bagels have eggs in them, so they tend to have more protein as well. So now, we've talked a bit about getting protein into your body, and now what do you do when you have it? So we call it that process protein metabolism. This is either when you use amino acids to make other compounds like neurotransmitters, hormones, other amino acids, or proteins, or when you use amino acids to produce energy or to store as fat or to make glucose to then make energy. So the first thing that you can do with an amino acid is you can do something called transamination where you turn one amino acid into another amino acid and typically you do this with to by taking an essential amino acid and making a non-essential amino acid which is what makes the non-essential amino acid non-essential the fact that you can make it from anything else so that's just simply taking an available carbon skeleton and taking the nitrogen and putting it on that to make a new amino acid. And you don't have to understand the specifics of this process, just that it happens. Uh, now, real quick, we should probably d define a couple terms. So I mentioned denaturing before and the fact that hydrochloric acid denatures proteins. But what does denaturing actually mean? This is when proteins are subjected to heat, acid, agitation, or other factors that disturb their structure and stability. And this means that they lose their shape and consequently their ability to function as proteins. We have to do this to allow ourselves to digest them, which is why we can't absorb complete proteins into our bodies. Uh, however, we also want this process not to happen in our bodies because when it does happen, it causes us to have poor health because our proteins stop working. Uh, the, uh, another process that we go through during protein metabolism is something called deamination, which is where we chop the, the nitrogen group off of the amino acid and turn it into energy. So, you know about denaturation again. So proteins will uncoil when they're denatured. Uh, when you Good example of protein denaturation that you probably know very well is cooking an egg. You notice how the egg white goes from being clear and viscous liquid to being a floppy white solid. Uh, this is due to the shape of the protein changing upon the application of heat. Uh, we mentioned the acid does this in your stomach. Uh, it can also do it in um, when you're preparing food, say something like pickled eggs. The pickling, the acid of pickling actually cooks the egg white. Uh, bases, uh, which are alkaline substances like lye, but also like baking soda, can also denature proteins. Uh, heavy metal, which is why heavy metal poisoning is so dangerous, but also the reason that heavy metals kill microbes in, uh, in liquid solutions is because they cause proteins to stop functioning. Also alcohol. Alcohol can, can limit protein function. And once protein function is lost, um, this can um, cause denaturing of your enzymes, which prevents you from doing basic biological functions. And it can happen during like a high fever. It can also happen when your blood pH is out of normal range. Now this can either be during something like ketoacidosis, which is what happens when you have diabetes, or if you have acidosis of the blood from drinking too much alcohol, or uh, there are other things that can cause this. It also happens during digestion, which is the only time when it's good. Now deamination is the process of turning a protein into energy. So you take the amino acid and you chop off the nitrogen and you get four calories per gram 
and you get a bunch of carbon skeletons, which can either be used to make fat or energy, and if they aren't, they get excreted in your urine along with the nitrogen. And there are a number of other things that amino acids can be can be used for so there are two sources of amino acids in your body the first is the ones you get from your food and then there are also amino acids from the breakdown of cells your body undergoes natural processes of birth and decay and when you do things like heavy physical activity you generate more uh, damage to your cells which then break down and your proteins have to then be recycled this goal goes into something called your amino acid pool and then you can do all the processes we mentioned. You can either make non-protein compounds like creatine, which is used by your muscles for energy, or serotonin, which is a fun neurotransmitter that makes us happy. Uh, you can also make other proteins like enzymes or antibodies or various components of cells. You can also make fat from amino acid carbon skeletons. This is stored in adipose tissue for later use. You can take amino acids and make glucose and then use that immediately for energy in uh, cellular respiration and sometimes you can also take the carbon skeleton and send it directly into uh, mitochondria to be used for energy um, nevertheless in all of these bottom three the nitrogen is lost and this forms ammonia that has to be used synthesized into urea in the liver and then excreted by the kidneys and whenever this happens in excess this can be dangerous because what happens is the amino acids come into your liver and anytime you break them down um, into not amino acids you release ammonia which combines with carbon dioxide to form urea which travels to the kidneys and then is transported to the bladder and excreted in the urine so if you take in too much protein it can be harmful so the first thing that can happen is that high protein diets mostly from animal sources tend to be higher in saturated fat and blood col and cholesterol so this increases your blood cholesterol levels and we know that this is a bad thing so generally you can solve this problem by consuming proteins low in saturated fat um, although there's no guarantee that this will 100% fix the problem if you're over consuming protein the other thing that can happen if you have too much protein and this is of concern for people on certain types of diets that encourage um, unbalanced nutrition and uh, say like low carb high protein diets if you get all of your energy from protein, you're producing a lot of nitrogenous waste, which all has to pass through your kidneys. And this can increase your risk of kidney disease, and nobody wants kidney disease. This is why they say a maximum of 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight if you're not doing ridiculous physical activity. And when I say ridiculous, I mean ridiculous. Uh, the other thing that you have to do, the more protein you consume, the more water you have to drink. Because if you're increasing urea production, then you need to also increase your the amount of water you're consuming to flush that out of your kidneys. Because if things build up in your kidneys, you get kidney stones. The last thing that, pro, that amino acids are used for, besides energy and making neurotransmitters and all of the things that aren't making proteins is making proteins. So there's a process in your body called protein turnover where existing proteins are degraded to provide building blocks for new proteins. And so obviously there's the protein you get from your food and then there's this is the protein that you get from breaking down degraded proteins. These go into your amino acid pool and you use them to make proteins. And the way that proteins are made is through the formation of something called the peptide bond. Peptide bond is where you take amino acid 1 and amino acid 2, and you combine, you stick their acid and amine groups together, releasing water, and you form this cute little structure, which is called a peptide bond. And it exists between each and every amino acid in a peptide chain. 
you can make more of these. So if you have two amino acids, it's a dipeptide. If you have three amino acids, it's a tripeptide. And there are several dipeptide and tripeptide molecules that are useful in your body, such as creatine, which is a modified tripeptide that carries adenosine triphosphate to your muscles to get used as fuel. Now, obviously, you can have any sequence of amino acids in your peptide chain. And since there are 20 different amino acids, the combinations are limitless. Now, the specific order of the amino acids in the chain is what determines what protein it actually is. And it determines the chemical structure and properties of the protein. And structure is everything when we're talking about proteins. So structure is what makes the protein capable of performing the function that it is intended to perform. If you change the structure, it will change its function. And sometimes that is a thing that you want. So if you have, say, a transport protein, you want it to, you want it a change in shape possibly to do some kind of mechanical work. Like if you have a sodium transport protein and you want it to transport sodium into or out of a cell based on how much sodium is surrounding that protein, then it might be good for it to be shifting back and forth. But in general, there are four structural stages of a protein. There's the linear structure, which is the specific order of the amino acids. And then there is the coil of the protein. And then there is um, the three-dimensional uh, curvature, which is held together by something called sulfur bridges. And then you have... This forms a full protein molecule, which can then bond to other protein molecules of the same type to form a strand of protein. So we'll take a look at that. And this biology is uh, quite involved, and you don't need to know the, the rigorous specifics of everything that's happening here, but it is good to understand how this process occurs and what, what the even reason to consume this nutrient is. It's very, very important. So, in the primary structure is the sequential order of the amino acids. The secondary structure is the spiral shape, which occurs due to repulsion between the different side chain groups on the amino acids. The three-dimensional shape is maintained by... Um, Electrostat electrostatic interactions and the disulfide bridges, which I, which is what determines the protein's actual function. And then sometimes there's these, these um, proteins will bond together to make larger proteins, which is something like hemoglobin, for instance, or a muscle fiber. And again, this is not something you have to know all the specifics of, but proteins are made when your DNA gets transcribed by RNA. And so you, your DNA unwinds inside the nucleus of your cell. It contains genetic code, which the mRNA picks up. The mRNA transports it out of the nucleus and attaches itself to a ribosome. And then more RNA brings in amino acids, which get thrown onto this zipper of a, when this, every amino acid that comes in gets added to the chain. And then eventually the chain is done being made and it gets released and you have this protein chilling right here. And that's why we have so much DNA because the DNA in our cells literally codes for every protein that our body could possibly need to survive. So here is an illustration of a coil structure of a strand of a amino acids. So you have the amino acids in their linear order that goes around 
and then the forces between these side chain groups force it into specific curvature which is shown here by the ribbon and this has a kind of a spring-like shape that's held together by electrostatic repulsion now obviously it's not just going to spiral in one or two dimensions but it's going to coil and fold around itself and then once it's folded around itself it'll just get held together by molecular glue or sometimes there will be a metal or a vitamin that comes in to activate the protein and here is a picture of something called actin which is the um, muscle fiber and you can see here it has a primary structure which consists of a sequence of amino acids it has a secondary structure which is a coiling ribbon which folds in and around itself in the tertiary structure of the g-actin globule which then exists in millions of copies in this microfilament of actin which is the muscle fiber and is the quaternary structure of the protein now obviously if you ate some meat you would be eating a fiber of actin that you would then have to break down into its components and then break down in further into its ribbon shape and distill down into its amino acid content so that you could build it back up again and here's a picture comparing a carbohydrate which is a chain of glucose units to a protein in this case insulin which is folded in on itself and held in its shape with these disulfide bridges which are pictured here which hold it in a very specific orientation notice every glucose unit is the same and a carbohydrate is just an indeterminately long chain of these glucose units a protein every every possible order of amino acids is a different protein and has a different chemical property and function and therefore proteins are significantly more complicated than carbohydrates here is a picture of hemoglobin so hemoglobin is actually made up of four different polypeptide chains all of them containing something called the heme group which is a molecular plate that has iron at the center of it uh, and this is the protein structure that transports oxygen from your lungs through your cardiovascular system to your cells for them to undergo respiration here's another picture um, which has a cartoon picture and then a picture of red blood cells and sometimes people have genetic issues because dna codes for all the proteins in your body it means that one of them encodes for hemoglobin some people have an issue with this dna section and it causes them to make abnormally shaped or sickle shaped blood cells uh, these are in addition to being p worse at transporting oxygen they also have a tendency to get stuck in your veins and capillaries and decrease your blood flow and people who have sickle shaped blood cells have a type of anemia that is very detrimental to the health if not deadly and anemia is when you have an iron deficiency so in summary in summary proteins function for growth and maintenance forming integral parts of most body structures such as skin tendons membranes muscles organs and bones as such they support the growth and repair of body tissues in addition enzyme proteins as enzymes facilitate chemical reactions like the digestion of your food and others hormones are made um from or by proteins and they also they help regulate your body processes um, proteins also make the receptors for hormones proteins are antibodies which help inactivate foreign invaders which protect you against disease they help maintain fluid and electrolyte balance which is what we're going to talk about next in this class 
um, which is essential for proper body chemistry is keeping the fluid balance steady. Uh, the acid base balance is a little bit more complicated, but proteins act as buffers in your blood, keeping your, the blood pH in a very specific range. Cause as you can imagine, if, proteins are sensitive to the acidity or basicity of a, of your blood, then a slight change in pH can severely affect your body function. Proteins also transport substances like lipids, vitamins, minerals, and oxygen throughout the body, and they also provide energy in times of crisis. Um, here are some examples of hormones. Uh, growth hormone, which as you can imagine, promotes growth. Insulin and glucagon, which are complementary hormones that regulate your blood glucose. Thyroxin, which is a thyroid hormone, which is very important in your meta met regulating your metabolic rate. We, we When we talk about cellular respiration, we'll also talk about the various metabolic processes that happen in your body and get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts of that. Uh, calcitonin and parathormone, which help regulate your blood calcium. It's another very important metabolic process. And uh, antidiuretic hormone, which helps regulate your fluid and electrolyte balance. And as we always remember, hormones are chemical messengers that are secreted by the endocrine glands in response to altered conditions of the body. And they travel to target tissues or organs and elicit specific responses. Uh, there's a number of a bunch of good information about this in the OER textbook that I posted on the Blackboard and on Classroom, which is a PDF of a nutrition textbook from the University of Hawaii. And it has every topic that we're going to cover in this class and more. So if you're looking to brush up on your biology or if you're just looking for a supplement to what you're learning in class, it's a nice one. Also, if you just like information and having things, uh, I would download it and give it to all your friends. So here is a diagram of how an enzyme functions. So you start with an enzyme. It has a specific shape, and usually it is tailored for a very specific purpose. So it's shaped in such a way that two compounds can come in and live next to each other for long enough for them to form a bond with one another. And then they get released as a new compound. And in the process, the enzyme has not been changed or has been changed so insignificantly that it can easily continue doing this many, many times. Now, here's a transport protein. So I mentioned sodium before. Sodium-potassium balance is of great importance in fluid electrolyte balance as well as in neurosignaling. Uh, the way that you maintain your potassium and sodium balance as you have transport proteins in the cell membrane of your cells and there's liquid outside the cell and there's liquid inside the cell. The, in order to transport sodium from inside the cell to the outside the cell, the sodium comes up, it finds the transport protein has been opened by the fact that it senses a high sodium concentration, so the sodium ion moves into the transport protein and then the transport protein sees that there's sodium in there so it changes its shape and it opens up to the outside and the sodium gets released and now the sodium concentration is higher outside the cell than inside the cell which is important the same can happen if you need more potassium inside the cell the there's a different transport protein for potassium notices that the potassium concentration is high outside the cell and low inside the cell. So it changes its shape so that a pro potassium can fly in here, get stuck, and then get spit out on the inside. Now, there's obviously fluid in a number of different places inside your body. There's fluid inside the nucleus. There's fluid inside the cell outside the nucleus. There's also fluid between the cells. And there's fluid inside your blood vessels. So all of these different places have to have the proper fluid balance between them. Otherwise, you can develop dehydration or high blood pressure. And a case for consuming enough protein um, in a normal situation, when blood flows from your heart into your tissues, blood pressure causes fluid to be filtered out of capillaries and into your tissue fluids. Now, if you have enough protein, then the protein in the blood 
causes the fluid to be drawn back into the capillary after the oxygen has been expended. And then it flows back to your heart and you get more oxygen and the, the process continues. If you don't get enough protein, then you don't have the transport proteins necessary to suck the fluid back out of your tissues and you get something called edema. And this leads to swelling and severe discomfort. So, speaking of protein deficiency, vegetarian diets are typically uh, diets in which people restrict themselves to foods of plant origin. Now, as we mentioned at the beginning, this causes difficulties simply because protein is more bioavailable from animal sources than from plant sources. However, there are plenty of animal sources of protein that don't involve eating the flesh of animals, so many people elect to consume those. There are a number of health benefits for, for choosing not to consume meat. Um, there are also ecological, religious, ethical reasons for doing so, as well as concerns over food safety, especially in um, the modern world. It's very difficult to ensure the sanitary conditions that meat is produced under. Um, there are also a number of different types of vegetarian diets. So probably by far the most common version of vegetarianism is what we call a plant-based diet or semi-vegetarian or partial vegetarian or the fun term flexitarian. This is a person who mostly consumes vegetables, grains, nuts, fruits, legumes, sometimes seafood, sometimes chicken, sometimes eggs and dairy products. And they tend to exclude or limit red meat, but may also avoid or limit other meats. A slightly more strict version of this is something called a pesco-vegetarian, which is like a semi-vegetarian, but excludes all red meat and poultry, but still eats fish and seafood. And then there's the lacto-ovo vegetarian, where you eat no animal flesh at all, but still consume dairy and eggs. Um, then there is a lacto-vegetarian, which eats no eggs either, but still consumes milk. And then an ovo-vegetarian, which consumes eggs, but no milk. Then there are vegan, also known as a strict vegetarian, which consumes only plant-based foods, the thing about a vegan diet is that it's, it may not provide adequate vitamin B12, zinc, iron, or calcium, in which case that person will need to supplement those things. Uh, there are even more severe vegan diets, such as something called the macrobiotic diet or the monk diet, where you eliminate everything except for brown rice and other bland foods. Um, this is typically done sort of as a spiritual cleansing experience and can in fact cause malnutrition and death in extreme cases. So I wouldn't really recommend it. And then there's a, something called a fruititarian, which is somebody who generally eats only fruits and honey and vegetable oil. It is also severely deficient in protein as well as calcium, zinc, iron, vitamin B12, riboflavin, and many other nutrients. Uh, again, it might be something to do for a brief period of time, especially if you're doing something like intermittent fasting. However, unless you are, have a specific health goal in mind, it's not recommended that you do any kind of strict dieting. And even then, it's better to just make sure that you're properly nourished at all times and remaining active. So there are a number of health benefits of vegetarianism of some form. Generally, they consume lower fat and lower total calories, and many Americans specifically eat too much fat and too many calories. Um, the presence of less fat and generally more soluble and insoluble fiber leads to low blood pressure, um, generally reduced risk of heart disease, fewer digestive problems, reduced risk of some cancers because of the lower amounts of inflammation, and reduced risk of kidney disease, kidney stones, and gallstones. All great benefits. Now there are also challenges. So 
vegetarian diets can be low in some nutrients, although they don't have to be. Uh, vegetarian diets can also be associated with disordered eating. So some people become vegetarians because they find out something about meat that they didn't know before, or they have some kind of anxiety about consuming meat. And so they stop consuming meat, but they don't replace it with new sources of protein and vitamins. And so they end up becoming malnourished. Uh, this is something that we used to say in college. Somebody starts being a carbitarian where you live out of a vending machine eating chips and crackers all the time. The easiest way to, to do this is to start eating soy, but soy can um, have its own issues. Uh, also, complementary proteins like red beans and rice is a good one to do because it's fairly um, mild and easy to obtain. In general, vegetarians have to pay special attention to vitamin B12, vitamin D, riboflavin, which is vitamin B2, and the minerals iron, calcium, and zinc, because these are more bioavailable from meat sources. Now, one of the good sources of protein, if you're a vegetarian, are legumes, which are a legume plant, specifically a pea plant, is shown here. Um, the, nit the protein where the nitrogen is stored is in the seed, which is the pea, which is why eating the pea gives you a lot of protein. Uh, the thing about pea plants and legumes in general is there's something called nitrogen fixing, meaning that they have roots that encourage the bacteria necessary to change nitrogen from one form into the form that is usable by plants and humans, which is ammonia. And the vegetarian food pyramid is shown here. It's very similar to the now outdated food pyramid for non-vegetarians, except um, up in the top here, they have nuts and seeds and oils instead of sugars and sweets. And here for dairy, they also include a section for not vegan fortified non-dairy substitutes. Now, interestingly enough, Recently, I've seen a number of very nice-looking vegan cheeses made from nuts, which have been processed with enzymes in the same way that a dairy cheese would be made. And I imagine that those are quite good for you. They are definitely delicious tasting. Over here in the meat section, instead they have beans and protein foods. Notice peanut butter is listed here. Peanut butter is a great one if you can eat it and you don't have an allergy to peanuts because it does contain all nine amino acids and polyunsaturated fats. So you can, if it's not sweetened with sugar, you can have more of it than you think you can, especially if you're not eating any meat. And then the vegetable section is more detailed. They want you to get regular vegetables and then green leafy vegetables specifically for the B vitamins. And then fruits they kind of they break it up into fruits and dried fruits because dried fruits have different vitamins in them from being sun dried and then they make a special point of whole grains for your grain con your carbohydrate consumption because whole grains have more protein than uh, bleached and processed grains Now, I mentioned nutrients of concern. Well, here's a table that gives you exactly the things that those nutrients do. So vitamin B12 helps with DNA synthesis and the protection and growth of nerve fibers, as you can imagine, that's quite important. But you can generally get vitamin B12 fortified cereals as well as you can consume yeast. So uh, there's B12 in yeast breads. Uh, soy products also sometimes have B12 in them. And also vitamin B sub, B12 supplements. Um, vitamin D uh, helps promote bone growth. You can get that from exposing yourself to the sun, but it's made from cholesterol in your skin. And some places don't have adequate sunlight exposure, especially in the wintertime. So you can get that from a number of supplemental sources. Um, riboflavin, which is B, vitamin B2, helps with, your, helps with energy metabolism and helps you with your vision and skin health. Um, you get that from whole grains and also enriched grains. 
and also green leafy vegetables and mushrooms, which is why you always see kale and mushrooms in veg vegan and vegetarian recipes, uh, as well as from beans, nuts, and seeds. Iron, which helps this, uh, with oxygen transport, as well as in synthesis of amino acids and hormones. You can also get that from whole grains, as well as things like prune juice and dried fruits, which is why dried fruits are recommended. Um, the type of iron in dried fruits is different than the type of iron in undried fruits because iron can exist in two forms. You can also get iron from beans, nuts, seeds, and leafy vegetables like spinach. Calcium, which is very important for bone health and muscle contraction as well as blood pressure and nerve transmission, you can get that from fortified soy milk if you don't drink milk. Uh, you can also get it from almonds, dry beans, and leafy vegetables like spinach. That's why Popeye's strong, strong for the finish because he eats his spinach. Um, and they also fortify breakfast cereals with calcium a lot of the time. Then zinc is important for DNA and RNA synthesis as well as your immune function and growth. You can also get this from whole grain products and wheat germ, which is the genetic, the protein part of wheat. And then you can get it from beans, nuts, and seeds. So it takes effort and thought to maintain a diet like this, but if it's something that you want to do, it's absolutely possible. Now, there are a number of life stages that have increased protein needs, and this has to do with periods of intense growth or intense repair. So children are growing and building new muscles and bone, brain cells and bones all the time, so they generally need a lot more protein than a healthy adult would need. The same is true of pregnant women, because you're making another in human being inside of you, so you have to provide all of the raw materials to make that person. Um, other people that need more protein are elderly people because they don't consume as many calories but they're generally repairing their tissues more often same is true of somebody who's ill and if you don't get enough protein then you experience something called protein energy malnutrition now there's the version of this that you get when you're an adult which develops slowly it causes severe weight loss uh, severe muscle wasting, no body fat, uh, less than 60% growth. Um, and then there's the version that you get when you're a child, which severely deprives you of nutrients and impairs your ability to absorb any kind of energy. This is one of the conditions that's responsible for st severe starvation in the developing world. Um, We'll show a picture of it in a second. But there's another one called Quashercore, which affects older infants and children. So this is somebody who probably breastfed for the first year of their life and so was getting adequate protein from that, but then starts living in starvation conditions after that time. And this generally... It can occur from inadequate intake of protein, but also generally can occur from infections, which tax the ability of the body to make enough protein. It tends to have a rapid onset. Um, there's some weight loss and some muscle wasting, but you retain body fat, so you're using body proteins to make energy instead of body fat. And this is characterized by edema and a fatty liver, as well as a bunch of other horrible things. Um, and it's the deterioration of your body starts to occur. So picture A is the first one, Merasmus. This is the, I guess, the, tra the traditional, like, starving to death person looks like. And then there's, you've probably seen kwasher core in uh, the swollen belly of the child that's a, the, because they are, have infection they're infected with parasites and all sorts of other terrible shit and this causes them to have like an enlarged liver and this is all a, resulting from protein deficiency um this is an even worse picture. The edema and the large liver characters of Quashercore are apparent in this child's swollen belly. Malnourished children commonly have an enlarged ab abdomen from parasites as well because you don't have a strong immune system and you can't fight them off. 
Uh, something to take away from this is that uh, since the invention of fertilizer, uh, we have produced enough food every year to feed every person on Earth. So all hunger is a politically motivated. There's no reason for anybody to starve. It's just a distribution problem. So other issues that can encounter when uh, dealing with protein is that we're designed to eat whole proteins. Uh, our bodies aren't really set up to consume single amino acids. So if you drink a bottle of amino acids, it's probably going to have a bad effect on your body. Um, other things like high protein foods, you probably see these in the store from time to time, things that have extra protein in them. What exactly are they putting in it to make it higher protein? You know, if they put in a bunch of garbage protein that doesn't benefit you in any way, it's not really helping you. It's not providing you more diversity. It's not giving you essential amino acids. It's probably just pumping you full of nitrogen, which you then just have to break down and urinate out. Now, that said, pea protein has been shown to be the best protein additive for increasing muscle above other isolated proteins because it has nearly a complete profile of amino acids. Other ones, like whey, and whey protein and casein, are derived from dairy, and they're highly bioavailable. Uh, there are other things that are made from, protein, from amino acids or mimic amino acids, like MSG, which can be bad for your body, because MSG stands for monosodium glutamate, it's a sodium atom bonded to an amino acid, glutamate, and therefore your body, your body craves it because it's salt and it is an essential amino acid. However, if you get too much of it, you just create a bunch of nitrogen waste. Aspartame is a sweetener that's derived from an amino acid, phenylalanine. And... Um, so if your body has issues with phenylalanine, then you can actually have issues with aspartame. Um, and then I just mentioned amino acid supplements. You should probably avoid those because, first of all, they're usually derived from bovine organs, and that's just weird. But also, your body really isn't designed to absorb them directly without digesting them first so they can sometimes cause toxicity in your body. And one last thing. Um, the most recent findings are, I mentioned this earlier, that you want to spread your protein intake out throughout the day. Um, if you're active, 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight is more than enough. If you divide that by three or five, this... Uh, this depends on whether you like to have three meals or have three meals and two snacks. Um, but if you split your 90, say you need 90 grams of protein per day, you can have 30 grams at each meal. Or if you snack, you can split that up further because you can't really absorb much more than about 30 grams at a time. So it's a waste of time and energy and resources to eat a bunch of protein at once. And uh, that concludes our discussion of protein. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you're finding this information all very useful.